todo el mundo. But that was really. 1981. Rock. This is Stacy Lane Wilson, author and editor of the Rock and Roll Nightmares book series and director of the films The Ventures, Stars on Guitars, and The Second Age of Aquarius. Rock and Roll Nightmares, the podcast, explores the dark and mysterious and sometimes funny side of music from the 60s, 70s, 80s, and beyond. But that's just a jumping off point. Think of it as a 45 record you bought for the hit you know and then going to the B-side and discovering something really cool and unexpected. On this lo-fi podcast for hi-fi people, I will be interviewing, sometimes by myself, sometimes with a co-host, musicians, authors, artists, and filmmakers. Enjoy! My guest today is Tony Gardner. He's a legend in the world of special effects who got his start working on the Michael Jackson thriller video and hasn't stopped bringing us the goo and the gore since. When it comes to music-related projects, he's worked on films ranging from Rockula to the Beach Boys story Love and Mercy and videos for Slayer, Florence and the Machine, Foo Fighters, and more. When Foo Fighters decided to produce their own feature film, Tony got the call. Studio 666 features Dave Grohl and the band getting really, really gory, all with practical effects. Welcome to the show, Tony. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Stacey. I appreciate it. Yeah, well, I mean, I've been lucky enough to see you and your talented team at work on the sets of some horror films like uh, the Child's Play franchise and Scout's Guide to the Zombie Apocalypse, which was so much fun and I have been to your amazing workshop, but for the listeners who uh, haven't been, how about a visual of how things were when you were working on Studio 666? <laughs> uh, 666 was uh, uh, a crazy time with a lot of stuff going on. We it, COVID hit during all that as well. So um, we were working towards the last week of the shoot when we were going to shoot all the the big makeup effects stuff. And we had, we had basically, we had bodies on all the tables. You know, we had Rami's table, Whitney Cummings table, uh, Taylor's table, um, Pat Smears had, had a whole dummy body. So a lot of workspace was sort of becoming storage space as we were, you know, finishing all that stuff up and getting it ready. We had like, Chris Shiflett's severed head and Will Forte's head. And all that stuff was laid out when we were doing like kind of a final painting and touch up and tweaking and the blood rigs we were uh, testing out in the parking lot. Oh, and wow. In the studio and, and just running water through them for the, for the bodies coming apart and all that. Um, what do your neighbors you know, think of that? <laughs> Are they, they're probably used to it, right? I, yeah, I think our neighbors are used to it. One of our neighbors does uh, educational videos for schools. So I think he finds what we do very entertaining um, and appreciates the work that, that goes into it. <laughs> I think we're just kind of a freak show um, to everybody else in the complex though, because you know we'll go outside obviously to test the blood stuff and then spray the back of the head open and spray up the wall of the, the exterior of the building. 
Um, we learned very early on not to put any food coloring into the water, um, even if it helped make it easier to see for testing because we ended up staining the building um, and didn't really want to go down that route again anymore. So we were very cognizant of uh, testing all the 666 stuff with, um, with water, especially since there was so much of it. I mean, Rami's death, we had two 55 gallon drums as our reservoir. And um, we blew through one of those each take. I mean, it was like just an insane amount of liquid. So. Wow, yeah. I mean, that was a, a super gory film in the best possible way. But um, yeah, I mean, like your your workshop where you're at, it's in a very unassuming facade. You would never know what lies there no, beyond, excuse me, beyond the wall there. It's like a satanic uh, <laughs> Santa's workshop or something in there. Yeah, we keep a low profile and, and there's there's no signage or anything like that. And as of late, we have the healthiest lawn and plants. We've watered them a lot over the last few months. Um, well, um, Dave Grohl and the rest of the band are obviously fans of horror and comedy. And I know you've worked with them before um, on some of their music videos, but a feature film is obviously a much bigger undertaking. Um, what was that collaboration like with them? It was a lot of fun because uh, I'd worked with the guys a couple times prior. Um, and we'd done live casts of all of them and made them old for the music video for Song Run. And we'd done some makeup effects for some things that Dave had done and a couple other videos. And um, just always really enjoyed working with them. And um, Dave brought his daughter Violet out to the shop and we were showing them the Chucky doll and, and just kind of hanging out. And he was talking about recording in this um, this house that was super creepy up on this big hill behind a gate and how it, he had this, he feels like they should do a horror film there. So he asked me if I happened to have any sort of like, you know, do you have any sort of like list of ways you've wanted to kill people that you've never had a chance to do? And my answer was, of course, yes. <laughs> and um, it, it was sort of like one of those old school, I've got a house, I've got makeup effects, let's make a movie kind of thing, where uh, Dave was like, I have a story in mind for, for the house, and I'll, I'll write it down, and if you could write down uh, all your kill ideas, let's figure out a way to put all that together. So it started as this casual conversation and him showing me uh, video footage of the house saying, what do you think of this place? And then um, I ended up going there and checking it out uh, once I started writing all the death stuff down and realized that there was so much more in the exterior of the place to work with, like a swimming pool and all this sort of stuff and um, added to it. So we ended, I ended up with two pages worth of death descriptions and ideas. And then uh, Dave had like a page and a half of story. So the next step was to go hire uh, screenwriters to, you know, put it all together. Um, and then fairly soon after that, we started talking about directors. And um, he had worked with BJ McDonald before. And so had we, and BJ obviously really understands um, makeup effects. We've done some Slayer stuff with him, some Slayer music videos. And um, so I was really gunning for him and, and Dave really liked him. And uh, I know they talked to a few different people, but I was really excited that uh, BJ got the, the job. Um, he's so easy to talk to and he understands what we do. His wife, Adrian, does what I do. So um, it, it just made for a nice, easy shorthand. Uh, as far as being able to get stuff done. Yeah, I did watch a few of those Slayer videos to prep for this interview. And I have to say the gore is just like off the charts. It's, it's so much fun. Um, now you were talking about 55 gallon drums of blood just for one death scene. Um, now, did you shoot that inside an old yeah. house or was it, yeah. uh, it was a set? I was gonna say, because that yeah. house would be saturated and destroyed, right? Yeah, we learned we learned after the first test that we would we were going to ruin the ceiling. 
Um, so we were like, let's let's build just that corner of that room, like outside where we can let it drain, you know. And then they tented it off and hung like a, a drape uh, to represent the ceiling as far as like bounce. But it was basically not like a black tent. Um, and we went and we shot in there. And um, the house is up on a hill that we were shooting all mm -hmm. this at. And we were shoot they had sort of like a back parking lot driveway area uh, behind the house. And that's where we built the room. And that's where we, you know, it was tented off and all that. And um, I remember Dave saying that he went home that night and pulled out of the driveway of the house. And he said the, the, the street was literally running red. He said there was a river of blood, bloody oh water down the side of the road from the bottom of the driveway, like down to the bottom of the hill. So. Wow, it was, so that's a job well done. That's what I was gonna say. That's when we knew we'd done it right. The street, streets were running red with rivers of blood. It's like, okay. Was that the house that they were recording in or was it a different location? Yeah, no, that oh. was actually the house. Dave had right. rented it uh, originally years ago while he was remodeling his place. Thought it was a cool, interesting place to, to get some different kind of sounds. And then when they went to record their album, that house was available. So he they rented it for the recording session. Um, and then while they were there, you know, he was working late nights and stuff and he'd drive out at night and the place was empty. Um, and he said it was really creepy and it was really easy to be inspired to, to write the story. Um, and then after we finished filming, the house sold. And um, a couple months ago, they actually tore it down. Oh, wow. So it's, that's, it's, it's uh, sort of, stab at immortality it's in this movie now but it would have been fun had we known that they were gonna demolish it um to be able to like get a little more extreme with what we were doing like to the pool and the house and blowing out the windows and so how was it decided who would die and in which awful way i mean i love the death by drum symbol that was one of my favorite ones um yeah, so because the writers had come up with something uh, fairly complex for that whole death scene. It wasn't part of my list and uh, it was starting to get fairly complicated. And I, and I think it was Taylor, the drummer, Taylor Hawkins, who said, why don't you just throw a symbol at my head? They're like, that's a great idea. <laughs> it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And with the, with the symbol thing, um, they built that little fake wall that the symbol goes into that, that comes out of that little recessed area of the real wall. So it was re really easy to swap it out. But I, I took a photo of the wall with just the symbol stuck in it without Taylor in it. Um, Cause there was just blood like fanning out from under the symbol, like literally everywhere. It was, it was the biggest controlled mess that we had. Rami's was the most uncontrollable. When when I wrote out the lists of ways we could uh, kill people, um, a big factor in deciding who was gonna take on which, which demise was basically how tolerant they would be of the, the makeup effects stuff. And Rami was super patient and super chill with the life casting for one and he's, just a very kind hearted person with a good spirit. And it's like, okay, if there's anybody we can, we can torture um, and have him take it with a sense of humor um, and, and just go for it, um, it, it would definitely be him. Uh, he was up for getting a spray tan, shaving his chest hair into a big heart, <laughs> just being a goof and having fun with the whole part. So. It was, it was obvious that, you know, um, we could do whatever we, we needed to with him. And then ironically, we ended up just literally replacing him with animatronic puppets. So it, it didn't really matter. Um, same with Whitney Cummings, you know, the chainsaw comes out of her face. Um, and from that moment on, she's just a, a 
a puppet as well. So. Wow, those are so amazing, though. I mean, it really looks um, incredibly real the way that you you did that. I'm assuming that you know techniques must have improved quite a bit since the '80s and the golden era of the practical oh, effects yeah. slasher. How do yeah, they look totally. so real? How, how do you do that? Yeah, I, I wanted to make something that we could reset pretty quickly, and and have the two halves of the body be able to go back together, and we could line everything up and and go for take two or take three, because I know we'd have to move quickly. Um, the, the whole thing is pneumatic and has like a literally a control box that controls how it splits apart, like from the top down, and then how the two halves separate and hit the, hit the bed. Um, so after it, it worked, you could like basically hit another button and all the pieces would come back together and you might need to do a little bit of alignment, um, but you could clean it up and, and go for uh, take two. Well, um, John Carpenter, the director of Halloween and of course many other famous horror films is a musician himself. And so he knows uh, Dave and the band and makes an appearance in Studio 666. But um, how did that come about? And does he have anything to do with the music in the film as well? Um, yeah, he actually wrote the theme song that the movie opens with. John Carpenter wrote that. Um, and that came about because Dave knew uh, John Carpenter previously. Um, and John's son had come and worked with Dave on something years and years and years ago. And Dave was very gracious and kind to John's son. And John had never forgotten that. So um, when they were asking John if he could come uh, be, in the, be in the film for a day, just for a cameo. Uh, and he said yes. And then while he was there hanging out during that day, um, he and Dave got to talking. And, and by the end of the day, John Carpenter was writing a song for the movie. So, I love it. Yeah, that's a fun Easter egg. And you have a cameo in the film too, am I right? Yeah, yeah. I have... Uh, well, I have one and my hand has one. Okay. Um, right before Carrie King gets electrocuted, there's a hand, uh, like a black long fingered hand with claws that sort of like snakes down through the cables uh, in the foreground of a shot, kind of like the hand in Alien going through the cables when Sigourney Weaver is not aware the alien's on the pod with her. Oh, that okay, kind of yeah. The, that was kind of the homage. So it's kind of like there's something in the wiring was the idea. Um, and then the, the zombies that tear Dave apart in his dream within a dream nightmare sequence. Um, I, I'm the one, I'm the zombie directly to his right or directly on camera left of him when you're looking straight at him. So I had to be there anyhow to like prep the body and fill up all the the gut, so it's like, all right, well, I'll just pull out all the guts and, you know. That's of, fun. I love that like kind a show of stuff. And then, and then it was easy to reset because I was right there. I get to do a lot of zombie stuff every once in a while and, and I, I've always really enjoyed it. So, you know, why not do this one as well? In your opinion, why do rock music and the horror genre go so well together? That's a really, really good question. Um, but I can only sort of surmise. I feel like I feel like they just fit. I feel like there's a, a high energy um, and adrenaline sort of feel um, with music and with um, horror sequences, you know. And there's a lot of energy, there's a lot going on, and it's it's very extreme sometimes. And the the music complements the, the, the craziness of the visual sometimes because uh, again, I'll, I'll, I'll defer back to the energy, you know what I mean? It's just, there's so much going on in it. Um, I, I feel like those two genres have always gone hand in hand though as well because the music has always been such an important part of a horror film. Um, even back to Return of the Living Dead for me, I can't not hear certain songs now and associate them with um, certain movies, you know what I mean? 
besides the ones that I've done, it's like if I hear Bella Lugosi is dead, which is a you know a Bauhaus song that's in The Hunger, that's sort of horror in content, but also has a great beat and drive to it that supports the visuals that you're seeing in the movie. Um, I mean, to me, that's like a perfect match. Um, but it just feels like they've always gone hand in hand. And I couldn't tell you who was the one that realized it was a good fit first, but um, I think everybody else as time's gone by has definitely agreed because rock music's been a, a major part of, of horror films. It has, I and mean, there's always the even more overt combinations of that with theatrical performers like Alice Cooper, the yeah. that kind yeah. of melt the, the scares with the songs. And Guar and, and a bunch mm -hmm. of those people that, that go out of their way to be graphic or gory or, or extreme. You know, they, they create that marriage of the two on stage uh, right in front of you. Yeah. Um, so what's one band either from the past or one that's active now that you'd love to work with? I, I think it would have been really interesting to have done something with Prince because he seems so interesting and complicated. At the same time, I would have been curious to see what someone like him could have come up with utilizing genre stuff like what I do, you know. You'd have to come up with the formula for purple blood. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Greg Canamorty did that for Lost Boys. And, and uh, Greg also put glitter in it. So I think I'm two strikes behind um, what I would think Prince would need. But I think that that would be an interesting combination that no one would know what to expect. So I, I think it would be really intriguing to see what would what could come out of it if it were possible. Yeah, I like that. Um, well, before we wrap up, I've got to ask you, what is your own personal rock and roll nightmare? Okay, I have to say I've been really lucky with all the musicians we've ever worked with. I've had such a good time. I'd, I'd have to say the, the, the worst nightmare would be the literal nightmare that's the story of Studio 666. Just for those who haven't seen it yet, it's about uh, a singer, Dave Grohl, who gets possessed while he's recording an album, right? Yeah, he sort of descends into darkness and then he becomes possessed and then people start to die. Um, he loses his mind and uh, um, a bloodbath ensues. <laughs> it sure does. <laughs> Um, so where can fans uh, follow you online, Tony? Our company name is Alterian. And if you go on uh, Instagram or, or Twitter, I think it's at Alterian Inc. 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 INC, like Alterian Incorporated. Um, and then we're also on YouTube as Alterian Inc. Um, and then we have a website that's also... Guess what? I'll turn it <laughs> Let me guess. Yeah. Right. So uh, search for that Alterian Inc. and you can find us kind of almost anywhere. All right. Well, thanks, Tony. Such a pleasure to speak with you again and keep on rocking. Thanks. Thanks for having me. This was really fun. As always, before I close the show, I'm going to share a paragraph from one of the Rock and Roll Nightmares books. This is an excerpt from Gory Days, the 1980s fiction edition. The story is Hip to be Scared, and it is by Darren Gordon Smith and me. As the two men began to circle each other and shake their bodies just like the dancers in the Pat Benatar Hell is for Children music video, the party goers gathered to watch the fracas. Maddie wanted desperately to flee from the room, grab Monroe, and go but she couldn't because she was trapped between the barred window and the murderous duo. Phil pointed his gun at the ceiling, then fired. Hey, stop that, someone from the fifth floor shouted. Phil fired again. Maddie's ears rang and she felt weak. She watched in mute horror as Richard jabbed at Phil's soft belly, drawing blood. The music man put his hand to his midsection and stared in disbelief at the blood on his hand. You son of a bitch, he muttered bringing his weapon down and pointing it at Richard's head. Try that again. 
Richard laughed low and menacing. Hail Satan, he said, then skewered the producer's jugular notch, doing a deadly tracheotomy. As Phil tried to curb the flow of blood with his free hand, he pressed the pistol between Richard's eyes and fired. Instantly, brain matter flew out from the back of the punker's head as his skull shattered and flew in shards across the room. Those within range stumbled back. Ugh, barf me out, shouted the man in the boy George getup, swiping a chunk of viscera from his headband. This concludes another episode of Rock and Roll Nightmares. I'm your host, Stacey Lane Wilson. The theme song, Out for Blood, is composed and sung by Lars with a Z, Cabot, and the band is Fuzzbuster. You can hear the whole track in the horror comedy film Valentine Days, also with a Z. For photos of the guests and show archives, please visit the website rockandrollthings.com. That's rock and roll with an N. You can also join the Rock and Roll Nightmares Facebook group or follow us on Instagram at rock and roll nightmares books. That's B-O-O-K-S. This is an indie podcast, so your subscriptions and ratings are really important. Thank you for joining me. And until next time. 